we need to wrap up Unit 5 for Mike Crow Economics. Mike. He's fun. He's Mike Crow. All right. We talked about all of the other market types. The last one that we've got left is Monopoly. And the reason I like to go in the order that we have is because starting with perfect competition, moving through monopolistic, oligopoly, and monopoly, we get progressively more restrictive in terms of the number of sellers and degree of market power. Very difficult to get into a monopoly market, otherwise wouldn't be a monopoly. So the first thing we want to do is look at the specific characteristics of a monopoly. So that's where we want to start. All right. So compared to all of your other markets, with a pure monopoly, we only have one seller. which means that that seller does not have any competitors. Whereas a perfectly competitive firm is a price taker because they have zero control over the price whatsoever that people pay in the market. The monopolist is a price maker. to charge as high a price as the market can bear because then they're going to lose sellers. It's very rare that you're going to have a monopoly that's facing an absolutely vertical inelastic demand curve, which means as long as demand slopes down, you're going to have the opportunity, if you're in the elastic range, which is probably what's going to happen with the upper prices, to sell more if you lower the price at least a little bit. So they're not going to charge the highest price possible, but we say that a monopolist is a price maker because they do have more control. So, what kind of product are we dealing with? Could be any one of a number of things, but in terms of major characteristics for the product, it is unique. Now, that could mean unique geographically, it could mean unique legally, which ties us to the last big thing, which is in a monopoly, for some reason, and we'll get into what some of those are in just a minute, there are barriers to entry. door. With perfect competition, we said that the product is very easy to make, it's very easy to get into and out of the market, there were virtually no barriers to entry. With monopolistic, we said yeah, there may be some barriers to entry, but they're very slight. With oligopoly, depending on whether or not you have a homogeneous product or one that's very differentiated or if you're dealing with economies of scale, you may have significant barriers to entry. With a monopoly, they are insurmountable, which means you're not getting past these. Now, different types of barriers. You might be dealing with legal barriers. Legal barriers can include things like exclusive contracts, patents, copyrights. If a particular company has the patent on a new device, then as long as they hold the patent, and as long as they're not willing to sell the rights to anyone, that is a legal barrier to entry. It means if anyone else starts producing that product or you know, tries to infringe on those patent rights, they're breaking the law. And the monopolist may go after them for big piles of money, depending on how much of the market they're going to lose because it's being infringed upon. Another issue you might have is access to resources. If we're talking about a resource that is very rare and we're dealing with a monopolist that has a very strong degree of vertical integration, 
That means that they control a lot of their resource suppliers and probably some of their distributors as well. So we're talking about firms at different levels in that supply chain. If they control the resources, if they own all of the suppliers for a particular resource, nobody else is cutting in on that action. So that's enough to keep other firms out of the market. Another one that can be very significant would be economies of scale. And what we're talking about with economies of scale, if you think back to what we did in the last unit, that means that for companies in a monopoly who have economies of scale, they're very big. So that for a firm to get into the same line of production is going to cost them a lot of money and be extraordinarily difficult to fund just for their startup costs. If, for example, you're talking about automobiles, there are significant barriers in terms of economies of scale to actually produce standardized automobiles. This is one of the things, if you look at the history of automotives, that's one of the things that really put the United States ahead of the game from the get-go. Because Henry Ford understood the value of production lines, standardized methods, and you know having an assembly process for the product instead of beating them together the way they were used to building carriages in Europe. That didn't work very well with cars. They were too pricey for one thing, very difficult for people to maintain. So these are three of the big ones. If we want to add in here with legal government contracts, you could probably throw that in the same category because if the government has licensed one company, for example, to provide water service to a particular city, then nobody else can get in on that. And when we think about monopolies, we usually picture, you know, like the big bad capitalist. But there are lots of different types of monopolies that are not harmful. Some of them are quite useful in terms of providing services and keeping things a little bit less complicated than they otherwise would be. For example, if you want to think about types of government monopolies, I'll give you a few examples here. One would be the post office. It would be very confusing if we had lots of different private companies competing for the right to deliver mail to your mailbox. Now, package services, there are a ton of them. There are a lot more than there used to be. But in terms of actually delivering letters, it's just the post office. Keeps it nice and easy to deal with. If you want a historical example of government services provided by private companies that didn't work, I'm going to pick on Charleston, South Carolina a little bit. I love Charleston. But the way they used to do fire protection in Charleston was that if you had insurance through a fire department, you had a little plaque in front of your house that said who was supposed to come put out the fire. And if it caught your neighbor's house on fire, then the fire company would put out the fire at your house. And if it spread down the street, they were out of luck. So there are a lot of reasons why with government services, we don't want a lot of competition, OK? So we can say the post office. We can say hey, utilities. Doesn't want to write. Those would be two big examples of monopolies that are not harmful.